Lighting Information Everyone Should Know for Home and Work, presented by Elaine Kitchell. Elaine is a nationally recognized expert on lighting with more than 25 years of research. She's had 80 articles and two books published. Hi, I'm Elaine Kitchell. I need to tell you that this presentation is the property of the American Printing House for the Blind. If you'd like to reuse it, you may contact them at 800-223-1839. The first thing you should know about lighting is that cool white fluorescent lights and full spectrum lights and daylight tubes or lights are all destructive to the human retina. Unfortunately, these are the kinds of lights that most of commerce and education and all public buildings are lit with. These are code words for high in blue and ultraviolet emissions. Every light bulb has a range of emissions that it puts out from ultraviolet down to infrared. And we'll talk about those emissions a little bit later. But for now, what you need to know is that bulbs and tubes and LEDs that emit a high proportion of blue light are destructive to the human retina. In fact, uh, studies that took part in uh, Sweden by Dr. Chen and several others of his um, colleagues showed that after only four minutes of exposure, retinal cells begin to die. Whoops. So cool white lights, full spectrum lights, or daylight tubes, and these are all names for the same thing, um, are something that we want to avoid when we are outfitting a workspace or a living space for people who have visual impairments. Now these things that I'm going to suggest are also good for people who have typical vision, but they're especially important for people who have damage or disease in their retina because their retinal cells cannot keep up with the byproducts of photoreception. And that means that every time one of your little photoreceptors on your retina, which are the little cells that take light and turn it into a signal that it sends to your brain to tell you something about your environment, every time that happens, they produce a waste product. And if the waste products in the eye aren't carried away efficiently, and this is very common in people who have disease and uh, damage to their eyes, um, then that sh shows up in the brain and the brain interprets it as glare. And we're going to talk more about glare and a term known as disability glare uh, just a little bit later. So if you don't remember anything else from this this presentation, remember this. Here we see a picture of a cave woman and her husband. And poor Grover, the husband, he, he looks like uh, he's had a really hard day. And she's pointing to him and she's saying, Grover, I've told you a thousand times, blue bad, red good. What we're talking about here is that blue light, typically and generally speaking, is bad for people and red light which is at the long wavelength end of the spectrum is good for people and I'm going to tell you. now remember that light comes in three different wavelengths and only three colors in the visible spectrum the first is red and it's the longest wavelength and the middle one is green and it has shorter wavelengths than the red and the blue has very fast wavelengths, meaning there's a shorter duration between each peak in the wavelength. Now, where your eyes are concerned, each little photoreceptor on your retina does one unit of work for every peak in the light wave. So, the blue light waves are two trillion times faster than the red light waves. So, for every moment, or every second 
that you receive one unit of red light and one peak and your, f and your photoreceptor is doing one unit of work, it's doing two trillion units of work in the same moment if you're using blue light. So this is why it's important that we reduce the amount of work that the photoreceptors do so that people who have damaged or diseased retinas can keep up with the byproducts of photoreception. And what are those byproducts? Well, every time a cell in your body does its job, it produces waste products. And those waste products build up and then are carried away and cleansed by the kidneys, the liver, and other things. Well, the eye has its own little set of uh, things that clean it and get rid of the waste product. And, but if your eye is diseased, it cannot keep up with the production of waste product in the eye. And when that happens, the brain interprets that situation as glare. And glare is a very difficult thing for people who have visual impairments. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But let's talk back again about these colors of wavelengths. You might say to me, but Elaine, I can see more colors than red, green, and blue. I can see, according to Microsoft, 16 million colors. Well, the reason that you can see more than three colors is because colors overlap and your brain interprets them as a new color where they overlap. And here in this photo, you can see a circle of red light, a circle of blue light, a circle of green light, and they all intersect. Where red and blue intersect, we see purple. Where blue and green intersect, we see aqua. And where red and green intersect, we see yellow. And that's because our brain takes those two wavelengths when they arrive at the same time and says, oh, I'm going to say that this color is yellow. So that is why we can see 16 million different colors depending on how much red and how much green and how much blue is in the object that we're seeing. So when you're appreciating your 16 million colors, or however the number of colors is that you see, if you're colorblind, you probably see about 17 or 18 colors. Remember that it's not really your eyes that are doing the seeing. They're sending a signal to your brain, and your brain is actually doing the perception of the colors. So now let's talk about speed. Every peak of a light wave demands one unit of work by each photoreceptor. And two trillion blue light waves can fit into the same <coughs> moment as one red light wave. This means a great deal to us in terms of the, the amount of work that we're asking the eyes of people, especially those with visual impairments, to do. So how much is two trillion? If you made a 12 inch square column and filled it with two trillion ping pong balls, now think about this, you've got a column that's 12 ping pong balls by 12 ping pong balls, that's 144 ping pong balls for your first layer, and you build layer upon layer upon layer until you have two trillion ping pong balls, it would reach halfway to Mars, or it would reach around the world 16 times. And here we have our little caped marauder. He's, I call him uh, Mr. Red because he's wearing a pink cape. And he is traveling around the world and we can see his circuits around the globe while he's flying around the globe 16 times. So remember, I mentioned that for each unit of work, there is a unit of waste product given off by each photoreceptor cell. And in the diseased or damaged eye, this is a buildup of these waste products interpreted by the brain as glare. We can tell by looking at a person most of the time if they are suffering from glare. There's a picture of a little girl here, and we know that she's suffering from glare because she's squinting. She's got one eye completely closed. She's got her face kind of wrinkled up, trying to protect her other eye 
from the intense light that's coming in. So we know she's suffering from glare. And we also know that research shows that four minutes of exposure to blue light alone causes inhibition of the eye to make cytochrome oxidase. And this is why cell death starts occurring at four minutes. Because your eyes make the, this uh, wonderful stuff called cytochrome oxidase, and this is a chemical that is used to do, um, to keep the eye healthy to transport oxygen to it. So here at the bottom we have oxygen molecule and a water molecule and oxygen and water uh, transport, uh, are transported from one cell to another. And without oxygen and water, the retinal cells start to die. So we need cytochrome oxidase for that chemical reaction to take place. But long before cell death, there is glare. And this is the buildup of the byproducts of photoreception within the eye and the inability to get rid of them fast enough. And there are two kinds of glare. There's just regular glare that we've all experienced, say when we walk out of a theater at midday and we've been in the dark and we're suddenly in the bright noonday light. Um, and we, we all have experienced that that takes a couple of minutes of adjustment for us to be able to see appropriately. But disability glare is, is different from that, it's, a, it's worse. And let's talk about the uh, factors of that. First, disability glare, uh, we might be completely unable to see or we might be able to see just a little bit. Um, we might have a painful sensation in our eyes and this is real typical of people who do have visual impairments. We have a high need for sugar and that's why I have a picture of a cupcake on the slide. We have inability to concentrate, inability to focus at a near distance, which is what we call accommodation. And we may also have a headache. Now think about this. If a person has been sitting in a classroom or an office all day that is lit with cool white fluorescent lights or cool white LEDs or cool white anything, um, they are working their eyes two trillion times harder than they need to. The products of photoreception build up in the eye and over time they begin to be unable to see and they have these other um, features such as the painful sensation and the need for sugar. How many people do you know that about three o'clock in the afternoon they're running to the candy machine? They have a need for sugar. They're irritable. They can't concentrate. They have an inability to focus. They're suffering from glare. And we know that this happens to our sighted friends as well as to our friends without sight. And uh, it doesn't really matter if you can see or not as long as light can get to your uh, photoreceptors, you can suffer from glare. And even though you may not be able to see what we know is glare, which is sort of a bright whiteness that um, is painful, even though you may not be able to see that, your body can still suffer from the physiological effects of glare. So your need for sugar might go up. You might have sudden cravings. Um, you might have that pinched feeling in your head, which is the oncoming headache. So these are signs to look out for, for disability glare. And um, my goal really is to have the rehabilitation people think of disability glare as an actual disability because many people are asked to work in conditions that make them suffer from disability glare all day long. And we're not recognizing that as a, um, as a real problem and as a, as a field of expertise where uh, those of us in the rehab field are not, not recognizing that as a um, bona fide problem that, that should be dealt with. So what about retinal cell death? Well, if we spend too much time under cool white light, daylight, or what we know as full spectrum bulbs, we are experiencing retinal cell death. And retinal cell death is permanent. 
Retinal cells are not replaceable. They are not like liver cells. They're not like skin cells. They do not come back. Um, here I have a photo of a slice of retina and the cells, uh, the photoreceptors have been tinted and the rods are red and the cones are green. And we can see some of the cones and rods are just barely have little lights at their tips instead of being fully colored as the ones in the front are. And this is because they're dying. They don't die all at once. Um, it, it is a gradual process, but if enough of them die, then what you'll experience is a uh, blank spot or gray spot uh, in your vision. Now, some of these are very, very, very tiny and you don't notice them at first, but if you get a great many of these and they start to coalesce, you can definitely notice um, blank spots in your vision. And um, when this happens, we know this, we call it macular degeneration. There are several types of macular degeneration and this is one. So what are we to do? Um, before we can answer what we need to do about this blue light and the conundrums that it presents us, we need to understand a little bit about circadian rhythms. Recent studies by physiologists show us that everyone needs a little blue light each day. Um, blue light is necessary in order for our body to perform uh, at its peak, physiologically speaking. You've heard a lot about this recently in terms of uh, the sleep cycle and um, how circadian rhythms govern our sleep cycle. And blue light is necessary for our sleep cycle and other cycles such as digestion and fight and flight response uh, all to work appropriately. So we do have quite a question here about uh, what to do about this. So I'm going to help you find the answer. Circadian rhythms are physical, mental, and behavioral changes that follow a 24-hour cycle. They respond mainly to light and darkness in an organism's environment. And they're found in most living things such as animals and plants and even tiny microbes. The study of circadian rhythms is called chronobiologist. And in my last presentation of this, um, I was fortunate enough to have a chronobiologist come up afterwards and talk to me and uh, was interested in what he had learned um, during my presentation and uh, offered to send me his uh, email link. And we've had a good correspondence since then and I've learned a lot about chronobiology since then very happy for the connections that we make through these workshops. And these chronobiologists have found that we have a tiny cluster of cells in our eyes that connects directly to our circadian clocks. And this cluster of cells was discovered in 1944 and it connects directly to our master clock in each of our brains and it's very sensitive to blue light. Um, it tells our brain how many hours of blue light that we've been exposed to so our brain can perform the functions that it needs to. The master clock that controls these circadian rhythms consists of a group of nerve cells in the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. I don't expect you to understand that or remember it because I certainly don't but we can just call it SCN. The SCN contains 20 nerve, I'm sorry, 20,000 nerve cells and is located in the hypothalamus, an area of the brain just above where the optic nerves from the eyes cross. And so it's this tiny little uh, organ about the size of a raisin that hangs there right in the middle of our brain that controls all of these things. The hypothalamus controls the internal thermostat, hunger, thirst, fight or flight response, rest and digest response, 
mating behavior, and the sleep and wake cycle. So think about this. These are all very important functions to our bodies, and they're all regulated by the amount of blue light that we experience during the day. But blue light is bad, so what are we going to do? This is just a little picture of that little raisin-shaped organism in our brain and the many areas of it. And we can see that it's got oh, about 12 little areas that um, control different functions. And I just put it in there so that you can see how complex it is. In this master clock, it decides when you've had enough blue light and it's time to go to sleep. And you can't hold your head up another minute and you must sleep now. I've got a picture here of a little girl. She's draped over her father's suitcase in the airport. She's got her head between the rails that, uh, that go up to the handle and she's draped over the suitcase and he's pulling her along and she is just dead to the world. She must sleep now. I guess she's had enough blue light. And airports are full of it, by the way. So ideally, you need three hours of blue light, five hours of green light, four hours of red light, and 12 hours of darkness. But let's face it, you can only get that if you live at the equator. And even there, variation occurs depending on the time of year and whether you're tilted toward the sun or away from the sun. So nobody is going to get the exact amount that they need is the point. And you really can get by on two hours of blue light during a day. And this includes exposure you get from your windows at home and at work, from going to and from the car, time you spend in Walmart or the grocery or the hardware store or almost any commercial store, time you spend outside, time you spend at work if you work in an office lit with cool wine or other bluish emitting tubes. So generally, we are getting, most of us are getting our two hours of blue light during a day. Um, and the the false belief that most people have is that this blue light has to hit this little cluster of cells on the back of your retina to go to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. But that's just not true. We have an alternate source. As you know, the body has many backup systems and we can get around that. Let's say, for instance, that your retina is scarred over that little place that collects the messages from the blue light. And most of the time you can't tell whether your sleep cycle is regulated or not. We know a lot of people that have visual impairments have highly disrupted sleep cycles. And it's because of this. But here's the answer to your problem. Here's your backup system. The skin on the front of your legs, from your knees to your ankles, is very, very sensitive to blue light. Let's say that I decide to, um, because my wake and sleep cycle has been disrupted, that I decide to put a blue light under my desk and shine it on my legs from my knees to my ankles during the day while I'm working. That blue light will create vitamin D which will send a signal to my brain, which tells me I've had enough blue light. Excellent backup system. And that way, my eyes don't have to get overworked by the blue light and work two trillion times harder than they need to. Because most offices and commercial spaces are lit with blue light, most people get far more than three hours of blue light per day. During school and business hours, blue and ultraviolet emissions from cool white and daylight or full spectrum tubes and LEDs are added to the normally green light environment. From about 10 o'clock a.m. until about 2 o'clock p.m., the natural light outside put out by the sun is primarily green light. 
and our body needs that too. And so if we're inside experiencing blue light all day long, it changes the normal circadian rhythms and confuses the brain. And it can make you sleepy in the daytime and wide awake at night. And here we have a picture of a, a poor fellow. He's asleep in his desk chair at work with his feet in his filing cabinet um, and his head on his desk trying to catch a little snooze because he's so sleepy in the daytime. So if recent studies by physiologists show that everyone needs a little blue light each day, what should we do in order to fix that? And I'm going to tell you. <laughs> 